Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Nick Anderson, and I'm the project director for American Roundtable. Welcome to the eighth and penultimate event in this series of American Roundtable conversations. For those of you who might be joining us for the first time, a few words of background about this initiative. American Roundtable was created to bring together on the ground perspectives on the condition of American small to mid-sized communities and what they need to thrive going forward. The proposition at the heart of this initiative is that too often our understanding of rural areas and small cities is reduced to caricature and oversimplification. So our hope is to highlight in all their complexity and nuance, communities often overlooked and to provide platforms for individuals and organizations to share their stories and work imagining, understanding and improving their local built environments. The nine reports of American Roundtable each look at a different community or region in the United States. Eight reports have been digitally published and the final report on Africatown, Alabama will be released next week. I don't wanna to take too much time away from today's presentations and discussion. So I encourage you to visit archley.org to learn more about the entire initiative and to explore all of the reports. This afternoon, we turn to Ohio's Mahoning Valley and the communities of Youngstown, Warren, Lordstown, Lowellville, and others. You will hear first from the report's editors, Killian Riano and Kristen Zyber, and then three of the report's contributors, Helen Liggett, Matt Martin, and Gary Honeywood. I'll then be joined by Rosalie Ginevro, the League's Executive Director for Discussion. We do hope to take some questions from the audience at that time, so please add any questions to the Zoom Q&A feature. And any questions that we aren't able to get to, we'll be sure to share with the presenters for follow-up after the event. I now have the pleasure of introducing today's panelists. Killian Riano is an architectural and urban designer, researcher, writer, and educator who serves as the Associate Director of the Cleveland Urban Design Collaborative at Kent State University. Riano is also the founder of Design Agency, a design studio exploring political engagement through architecture, urbanism, and art. Kristen Zyber is an urban designer and project manager also at the Cleveland Urban Design Collaborative, focusing on neighborhood planning, research, and mapping. Helen Liggett is an adjunct professor and photographer teaching in the architectural studies program at Kent State University and is the author of Urban Encounters. Matt Martin is the executive director of the Trumbull Neighborhood Partnership, the Community Development Corporation and Land Bank of Warren, Ohio. And Gary Honeywood is a crew member of Building a Better Warren, a program of the Trumbull Neighborhood Partnership that recognizes the need for resident-driven community revitalization. Please do visit the report on archley.org for additional biographical information. And with that, we'll turn things over to Killian and Kristen. Good afternoon, and thank you so much, Nick, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. It's a real pleasure to be here with you and to share uh, the work that we've been uh, working on, writing, editing for uh, a little bit over, over a year in a region that uh, uh, Chris and I have been to often and uh, have a great fondness for. Um, Today, uh, we, uh, we're, uh, uh, as um, uh, and Nick just introduced us all, but maybe we all just will say a quick hello. Um, um, hello, my name is Kim Mariano, and I'm the Associate Director of the CUDC. Chris. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Sieber. I'm a project manager at the CUDC. Really delighted to be here today. Helen? I'm Helen Liggett. Um, I'm a photographer and professor of architecture studies at Kent State University. And I've been doing community photography with CUZC for a long time. Gary? Hi, my name is Gary Honeywood. I'm a member of the Building a Better Warren uh, crew. I've been working here the last three years, so I've definitely seen a lot of things change in the area for the better. And it's my pleasure to be here. Thanks, Gary. Matt? Hey, good afternoon. I'm Matt Martin. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. I'm the director of the Trumbull Neighborhood Partnership, which houses the Building a Better Warren program. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, uh, you, you can turn off your video now and then come, uh, you'll come back in a second, Gary, Alan, and Matt. Um, uh, 
It's a pleasure to have the three of you join Kristen and I, and as well, we want to give an acknowledgement of the many uh, folks that contributed build, uh, building a better world and the rest of the team. Uh, Charles Frederick, who's a professor of landscape architecture at Kent State, Helen Liggett, Roy Messing, uh, Jennifer Roller, uh, Terry Shorts, and, and Kristen. Uh, we also have had great support here at the CUDC as part of the editorial team. Also wanted to give a shout out to Katie Slusher, uh, and to Caitlin Boniecki, who both uh, helped with graphics and uh, photography and other issues as they came up. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys a little bit of an intro and a little bit of a background of why uh, why us, why we're kind of interested in working in this region. Um, the answer is that we've been working in this region for a long time. Um, so as Nick mentioned, we're Kent State's uh, Cleveland Urban Design Collaborative. We're an outreach arm of the College of Architecture and Environmental Design. We've been located in downtown Cleveland for over 20 years now, but we do work all throughout Northeast Ohio. And we've been working with friends on the ground in the Mahoney Valley for over a decade now. Um, we bring some architecture studios uh, in person here to produce some speculative work like you'll see here. But we also do work on our professional, with our professional staff uh, with partners on the ground in the valleys. So um, we're currently working on a project with Youngstown State University on a project on economic recovery. Uh, in the wake of a Lordstown plant closure, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But generally, we are kind of friends and collaborators with a lot of the folks that you'll see and hear from today. Um, and Killian has been bringing architecture studios uh, to the region for a long time as well. So we're really big fans of the Mahoney Valley. Um, we've developed some real relationships here, and we hope to represent those voices for you all today. I wanted to give a shout out. I've been working with Trumbull, the Trumbull Neighborhood Partnership now uh, over six years. Uh, we began by bringing students from Parsons, this new the new school of design, uh, in, a in a studio and a seminar co-taught by Allison Mears, uh, Kevin McQueen, and myself. Uh, Allison, I believe, is here today, so I wanted to give a shout out to the work that we did at Warren for so many years. Thank you. Okay, next. Okay, so I'm going to start off by giving you all a little bit of a tour of the Mahoning Valley, uh, starting with its history, moving into a little bit of its present day, kind of what's happening on the ground here, and then from there I'll tee it up for our partners and our panelists to talk a little bit more about some possible futures for the region. Next. Okay, so before we even start talking about industry or post industry or work, we have to talk about the river. Um, the Mahoning River is really the reason why industry was here in the first place. It's the reason why these cities developed when they did uh, along the Mahoning River. The river is a tributary of the Ohio River. It flows southeast um, from Youngstown down across Pennsylvania into Pennsylvania, and it joins the Ohio River downriver from um, Pittsburgh. So like so many rivers, this was really the kind of primal backbone of the region. You'll see at the map on the right, Warren's kind of in the upper left of the map, Youngstown's the bottom right. And um, you know they flowed directly through the downtown. Um, so this is a really important backbone for the region. Um, it has been kind of always the reason why uh, industry located here in the first place. Um, so if folks outside of Ohio know Youngstown or Warren, if you've heard of it before, maybe you know about its steel mills, um, maybe you know about the Lordstown GM plant, um, maybe you know about it as uh, every four years as a bellwether for a certain kind of blue collar voter. Um, but actually Warren, Ohio was one of the first places in the country to make cars um, back in 1890. One of the first cars made by the Packard brothers in a plant in the Golden Triangle on the north side of Warren, which is still an active industrial park, one of the oldest in the country. Um, the river itself, plus the region's location near cheap coal and iron, uh, really made this area prime for emerging industries around the turn of the century. After the 1890s, production began to shift from iron over to steel, and that's really when the region took off. Um, the steel mills dominated the entire area, economically and socially, but also spatially. They really took over all the riverfronts here. Um, it's kind of hard to explain to folks that haven't ever been near one of our steel mills in this region, just how huge they are. I mean, they take up a vast amount of real estate. Um, they, there was at one point over 27 steel mills as tall as 12 stories. Um, one mill in Warren, the copper weld steel site, spread over 10 million square feet. Um, so obviously with all of this kind of labor booming, uh, we had a lot of people coming in as well. We had a lot of immigrant labor coming in um, from 1890 to 1930 and whole neighborhoods are really built from scratch. This is kind of the heyday of the steel. Um, other infrastructure developed along the river kind of leading out from there. So rail, later highways and um, Youngstown grew from 30,000 residents in 1890 
to over 170,000 by 1930, so quite a large city. Um, its current population for reference is around 65,000. 65, um, unfortunately, like other industrial cities in the Midwest, Youngstown and Warren were really hit hard when steel and related manufacturing began relocating overseas. Um, we kind of understand now, um, relying on a single industry like we, like we did at the time, really proved devastating. Um, and this all culminated in a day that um, is still known as Black Monday in the region in, on September 19th, 1977. Uh, the US Steel Company announced that they would furlough 5,000 workers immediately. Um, within a decade of that, the Valley had lost an additional 40,000 jobs um, and over 50,000 people had left the area. Uh, I will say jobs and overall population do continue to slightly decline through today, albeit at a, a less, a less uh, catastrophic rate. Next. So the legacy of steel really continues to loom large in this region. Um, the economy has shifted and adapted to some extent with the closure of the mills. Uh, we still, you know, there were still a lot of automotive assembly jobs, more advanced manufacturing, including related industries like tin and sheet metal continue even through this day. But, you know, it's hard to continue to grow as a region when these job losses kind of continued. So, so much of the hard work that our partners are doing on the ground today is really trying to stem that tide and trying to reverse it, trying to kind of create growth on as many fronts as possible and really grapple with, with what that means. Um, we love this statue. This is in downtown Youngstown at the Museum of Labor and Industry from 2002 by George Siegel. It's called the Steelmakers. And if I may add, uh, this is a controversial statue as it uh, commemorates something that people don't feel like it's history, that it, sh it's, it should be the present and the future. So an interesting moment in which uh, a public piece of art is actually controversial. Yeah, um, so we don't just want to belabor the industrial losses today. We also want to kind of, to Nick's point, we want to present the kind of full complexity. Um, Warren and Youngstown have a bunch of really great assets, a lot of great cultural institutions and community foundations, good parks, great old architectural gems. This is Trumbull County Courthouse, and obviously a lot of fantastic people who you'll meet shortly. Um, but we do think it's really important for you to understand this legacy around industry and especially manufacturing um, as we start grappling with what the future of work in particular might be uh, in, the, in the valley. And with this one also, um, one thing to emphasize a, a little bit about the, the physical environment of Warren and Youngstown, but particularly Warren, is that it looks very New England. It was Connecticut. Uh, and and it's and and this kind of H. H. Richardson-esque uh, type of architecture is actually not uh, unusual for this area. So uh, as much as we get the picture of the rusting um, uh, steel mill, this is also part of its character. Uh, this is downtown Youngstown, continuing our tour around the valley. Uh, this is a view from their new riverfront amphitheater. So you'll see kind of the downtown uh, fabric here. And kind of flip through these pretty quickly. I just wanted to give you all a sense of, to Killian's point of kind of what, what the region actually looks and feels like. This is some of the housing stock in Warren kind of on, uh, leading into downtown. Um, lots of sort of older, uh, you know, housing stock that if any of you are interested, I'm sure Matt could help you uh, hook you up with one of these houses. There's a lot of them. Um, go ahead. And then this is in downtown Warren. This is Dave Grohl Alley. This is Warren's most famous son, um, honored with a pair of massive drumsticks here. Okay, but we do still have a lot of these legacy industrial sites. Some of them are still in use, um, some of them are vacant, and a lot of them are really directly adjacent to existing neighborhoods. Um, they often leave some fairly serious pollution, complicated ownership. Um, there is still some kind of rusting facilities, to Killian's point, and other issues that really leave some headaches for those folks on the ground trying to make uh, actual redevelopment and reuse happen of some of these sites. Next. Obviously, when we start talking about loss of population, there's going to be kind of a, an equal loss of, of housing as well. So um, a lot of houses have kind of been demolished over the last few decades, um, leaving vacant lots to try to figure out what to do with. Um, you know, there's a lot of under, less used infrastructure as a result of all of this, and generally fewer economic opportunities for residents. Um, we do want to note that the question of race looms really large in these cities. Um, the cities proper are far poorer with a much higher percentage of African-American residents than the surrounding suburbs. Um, last year, Warren declared racism a public health emergency. Um, as alluded to in a more recent blow in 2019, the major General Motors plant in Lordstown announced that they would be stopping the operation of, um, this is where the Chevy Cruze was manufactured. 
Um, the plant was 6.2 million square feet on over 900 acres. If any of you have gone through Interstate 80 at any time in the last 50 years, you've seen this plant. It's adjacent to the highway and it's huge. Um, an overall loss of 3,000 jobs, which is, which is a, a pretty big blow for the region. Um, a lot of those workers were offered the opportunity to relocate, but they had to kind of decide if they wanted to leave their, their home uh, in the Mahoning Valley. Um, a new battery operated truck company, Lordstown Motors, has claimed a portion of this plant for some new production of battery operated trucks, um, but it really won't replicate the number of jobs or the overall economic production that GM left behind last year when they pulled out. Um, so even with all that history, manufacturing has not left the valley. Um, you know, this is not actually a post-industrial place. There is still industry. They just don't employ as many people as they used to. Um, just last week, Barb Ewing, the CEO of the Youngstown Business Incubator, said manufacturing is in our DNA. We know how to make stuff. Um, you'll see this on the right. This is kind of some of the, the work that's happening in additive manufacturing at America Makes in downtown Youngstown. Um, so there's a lot of kind of interesting work uh, brewing in the region right now around what shape can manufacturing take in the 21st century and how can Youngstown and Warren and Lordstown really position themselves to take advantage of some of those developments. Um, but even as new plants and factories come online, this is the new LG uh, electric battery plant, um, overall employment is still declining, especially in the manufacturing sectors. So uh, there are fewer jobs in these sectors, that, but they need more education and more specific skills training. Um, so as much as manufacturing is still, to Killian's point about the steel, the steel mills uh, statue, as much as manufacturing is still at the root of many uh, residents' identity, you know, the job numbers aren't really backing that up. Um, so the question then for us, one of the questions that we were really exploring in this report is, you know, if manufacturing or any single sector isn't necessarily a singular path forward for the Valley, what else might be? What's the kind of constellation of, uh, of uh, alternative futures um, that might be kind of a, a path forward or kind of a, some of the growth and future of the Mahoning Valley? And I think the rest of our panelists will really be giving you a little bit of an overview of what some of those alternative futures are. Thank you so much, Kristen. Uh, and it's worth noting that although this is the biggest building, this is a GM and LG partnership to create solar parts of solar batteries, not even the entire thing. Uh, even though that's the case, uh, um, uh, it's always the question is who those jobs are going to benefit. Uh, there's still a lot of like the unemployment, a lot of uh, uh, poverty in the city course. Uh, and a hard time attracting and were, uh, uh, folks from these communities to those jobs. They, there's actually even a lot of jobs in construction is something that we learned quite a bit from Matt and Gary, uh, but, uh, but it's how to create an economy that's inclusive in nature and that this can be part of it, but what are some of the other solutions that can attract more folks? And that is really one of the things that we, we were looking for in, our, in the report is to, uh, focus on uh, all the sections that the American Roundtable had set out, uh, which are public space, um, uh, health, uh, uh, work and economy, uh, infrastructure, and then the environment around work and what they mean both for the identity of this valley as it sees itself and as it sees itself working in, in, uh, in these issues. Uh, the first, uh, so I'm going to go section by section, just showing you and talking slightly uh, about the, 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 some of the pieces you're going to see. Uh, the first one is in the public space is a sector of the report. Uh, it's called A City Built by Hand, is by Helen Liggett. Helen is going to describe it with a lot more, uh, a lot more in, 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 uh, in a minute. But for now, what I'll share with you is that Helen, with the help of Trumbull Neighborhood Partnership and the, and the Youngstown Neighborhood, Development Corporation went out and photographed uh, examples of how people are uh, in on the ground are beginning to take on vacant sites and beginning to be uh, create new things out of them and even uh, one can say that even to create uh, new civic incubators new places where new ideas can come out of so even using a little bit of that uh, economic development kind of language that gets uh, tossed around in this community quite a lot and what does it mean when you have sites around that uh, around you that are empty and what can you do with them? And then as well, uh, Matt is going to talk a lot about the work that they do to support these community efforts. Uh, Kristen and I both like this image quite a bit because it, it shows how the, the Valley and its public spaces uh, are adapting to, um, to COVID. And, and for example, some of the same things that we've seen 
from all over the, the country and even world. Uh, you, we can see here, uh, this is uh, the, an amphitheater on the, on the river shore of the Mahoning, uh, waiting for a concert, a uh, Jimmy Buffett concert. Uh, for health, uh, this section was uh, created by Killian, uh, by me and Kristen, by Kelly Riano. Uh, and what we were uh, curious about here is the Eds and Meds. Uh, as many uh, communities uh, lose uh, employment in, in industrial sectors, uh, often they're trying to make up for them in the educational and, and medical sector. Uh, and we, so we were interested in to, to look at Mercy Health and the hospitals in this area and see them as anchor institutions. And we'll go into what that means a little bit more in a second and to see what the role is in the community and how viable that is. And whether there's also a bubble similar to having all your jobs in, in, in the car manufacturing sector, if having um, too many jobs in health, it creates a bubble in itself that, you know, as as the pensions or uh, as the health benefits that you once had through the union at GM and other places go away, what happens then to those health benefits as well? And so we created a series of maps and, uh, and these are created by Kristen that were created through research and also conversations with folks on the ground. And so for example, this one talks about both how, uh, how the employment overall has grown in the valley, uh, but also how the health facilities themselves have been concentrated, have, uh, have uh, contracted, they, they, they've concentrated and centralized so that uh, there are fewer um, actual uh, health institutions taking care of the folks. There is a less population, but one of the questions uh, as always is around accessibility. Uh, for example, uh, some, some of the birthing um, uh, units in Youngstown are outside of the, of the city and it takes a little bit to get to them. So how to make sure that that uh, 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 continues to be accessible. Uh, I'm just gonna jump in here really quickly and identify this quote that's on the bottom here by uh, our partner, Sarah Lowry at the Healthy Community Partnership. You know, we asked that question of her of healthcare jobs are growing and most of the rest of the jobs in this region, especially manufacturing are declining. So, you know, are, is that kind of a, a potential path forward for the Valley? And she said, you know, hospitals, they're there, you know, people don't necessarily think about them in the same way that they think about factories. And she said, this region still identifies strongly as a manufacturing region. So quotes like that have really guided a lot of our thinking on this. Uh, next, uh, we're looking at, at anchors and consolidation. So similarly, uh, and the quote here by uh, the director at the time of the Mercy Health System uh, that says, I don't think healthcare will be the new GM. They were a different kind of anchor, but Mercy is an anchor too. If we're not operationally efficient, then we will die out. You won't uh, have good success in your healthcare if you don't also have a great economy. We'll go into a second into a larger conversation of what Mercy Health and other hospitals are beginning to do in this realm. Uh, and then the access and equity, which is part of the story, right? As, as the, there's both more jobs, uh, access to those jobs, uh, but less institutions. How do you access them when you need to, to be, when you need both that, 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 uh, those jobs and when you need to be seen for, for a, a health issue? Uh, and what we're, what we're noticing is that some of the poorer communities are, are having less access. Um, uh, and Lisa, uh, Lisa Ramsey, one of the deputy directors of TMP says, I'm always hesitant to blame the current economic downturn for health issues. It's been 40 plus years of decline. I have never lived in a world that isn't in decline. Uh, Kristen, do you wanna add something? No. Uh, and then we looked at how some of the things that are happening, and especially in our conversation with, uh, with Curtis from the Mercy Health System, as part of a larger process that is happening, where um, uh, here in Cleveland, uh, the, the Cleveland Clinic, the Democracy Collaborative, the Cleveland Foundation, the Ohio Employee Ownership Center, which you'll hear about, uh, created a series of cooperatives, employee-owned cooperatives, uh, by the community surrounding and uh, using the Cleveland Clinic's purchasing power as a way to create new uh, uh, employment opportunities and ownership opportunities of those jobs. Uh, that has become now the Health Anchor Network, which is uh, a network of hospitals from all over the region and the country that are reimagining their role within community to not just serve healthcare, but to really take care of the overall health of the communities that they are around. Uh, so that includes the jobs, the services, and the 
the spaces that they go around. So we described this uh, a little bit too, because it seems like an interesting opportunity, an interesting model, and one that has not been proven as of yet, but one that could uh, it, it have, um, in the, one that in, in a professional capability, Kristen and I are exploring in Youngstown as well, doing some plans and designs around that, that Mercy Health Center around Youngstown. And next is the work and economy section. And again, we talked about this being a little bit of the heart of our report. So we have three pieces here. Uh, the first one is the, the interview with the Building a Better Warren team. Uh, the Building a Better Warren team is, is a really exciting project started by the Trumbull Neighborhood Partnership. And in a way it started because the Trumbull Neighborhood, uh, uh, Trumbull Neighborhood Partnership and its role both as a community development corporation and the land bank was doing uh, a few things. It was, uh, it was uh, taking uh, inventory of the housing and uh, that, they, that they, they were given as, uh, again, because of the shrinking and uh, um, as people were leaving the area, some housing was left behind. Uh, they were, so they were looking at and seeing which, one, which of these should we demolish, which one should we uh, uh, remodel and, 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 which one, and which ones can we sell and which ones can we do different things with. But as we did, they did this work, they were finding that a lot of the construction companies and a lot of the construction needs that they needed um, uh, were being filled by construction companies from outside of the community. So why not use their role as an anchor institution to create both uh, employment opportunities, good, uh, benefit receiving jobs that, 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 that give training on the job, but also will, will uh, have a long-term uh, effects. For example, some of the folks, and Matt has mentioned this to me multiple times, might mention it in a little bit, that what his dream is for these folks to go out and start their own construction companies and that there's a new crew that comes in and that to create an ecology of people doing this work all over the region uh, and, that, uh, and to create the, the entrepreneurial, uh, the, 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 that entrepreneurial uh, project uh, and even perhaps as a, as a worker on cooperative. So here you'll see some of the work they do. They take care of some of the, the, uh, the land that has been vacated. They uh, go in and remodel spaces and sometimes rebuild them. Uh, all of this uh, often, uh, and this is something that you'll see through the interview, uh, is that some folks came with very little of the actual skills and they learn on the job with uh, working with each other and with folks with more experience. And this is an incredible experience uh, and, a, and a model that could be replicated. Next, uh, a conversation with Jennifer Roller. Uh, Jennifer Roller is the president of the Raymond John Wien Foundation, which is headquartered in Warren, Ohio. The Raymond uh, with the John Wien Foundation is one of the biggest funders in the area. They are uh, instrumental in creating Trumbull, the Trumbull Neighborhood Partnership and the Youngstown uh, Neighborhood uh, Development Corporation uh, and have been and are funders in some of the best things happening in the community. Uh, and, and Jennifer is a leader. And, and, and one of the things that I wanted to highlight was this quote, because this is something that I actually have seen uh, going around in the Mahoney Valley social media <laughs> structures. And something that's resonating is the vision that she's beginning to create. As, as, as Kristen mentioned, the, the majority of, of the population, the urbanized centers in Warren and Youngstown are African American, uh, the major, but the rates of unemployment are twice uh, the, 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 that of the uh, white community. Uh, on top of that, they have much higher rates of unemployment. Uh, and the conversation with Jennifer was really about uh, that future, uh, a future of equity for the, uh, the communities in, in the Mahoney Valley, uh, but specifically the African American community that um, we don't always focus on when we talk about the, the middle and working class that has lost in the industrialized cities. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna read this quote very quickly and then uh, I'll move on and I'll, and I'll uh, invite you to read the, the interview which I found fascinating uh, having a conversation with her. When I close my eyes, I see a family that could live anywhere and chooses to live in the cities of Warren or Youngstown. They choose to because the neighborhoods have been revitalized. They are not only clean and safe, but attract and well-maintained. The neighborhood kids make friends and play 
uh, and play in the yards and parks until the street lights come on and then play a little longer. The good jobs are more than a living wage. They provide the sustainability to pay expenses, ordinary and emergency, enjoy what life has to offer right now and invest for the future. Surviving is a thing of the past, thriving is all they know. Uh, and it's beautiful to both read those words and that kind of vision for the Valley, but also that uh, through her leadership, she's uh, working towards making that uh, happen. And finally, for the work and economy section, uh, an article by Roy Messing on employee ownership. Uh, this is something, uh, Roy Messing was the, at the time when he wrote this, uh, the director of the Ohio Employee Ownership Center at Kent State University. And he uh, and did this, uh, this employee ownership center was one of the ones that really uh, did a lot to bring cooperative employee ownership to uh, uh, Northeast Ohio and in the Mahoney Valley. And in his article, he describes uh, the, the scene after Black Mon uh, Monday that Kristen uh, uh, described earlier, in which uh, all of a sudden thousands of people had lost their livelihoods uh, and their families were worried. And how it, it was the, a bishop and the Catholic uh, community and the, in general, the religious community that began to create a series of platforms and conversations about how to move forward with employee ownership being seen as one of the key uh, models to move uh, to move uh, forward with. Uh, then he describes some of both of the challenges, some of the things that may not have worked so well, and then some of the successes, which is the this is Bra the Brainard Rivet Company, uh, which has been uh, was bought out by an, an existing employee owned cooperative, and it still continues to be so, and, and is a is a proud addition for jobs and and stability for the the Mahoney Valley. Next for infrastructure, uh, our very own director of, at the Cleveland Red Design Collaborative and an expert on uh, shrinking city, someone that has been looking at these issues for many, many years, uh, Terry Schwartz uh, uh, did a, a project looking at Youngstown. Uh, so as, as, as Kristen mentioned, uh, Youngstown grew from 30,000 residents in 1890 to 170,000 by 1930. Uh, that was a huge growth, right? Now there are less than 65,000 uh, residents in the Mahoney Valley. So that's less than half that it, than its peak. Uh, you can imagine that uh, the, the kind of infrastructure and the kind of urbanity that was created for 170,000 people uh, uh, cannot be maintained by a city with the tax uh, base of um, 65. So something needs to happen. And, and uh, Youngstown was famous for being one of the cities that began to recognize because no city, and this is one of the issues that Terry talks about in at length, is that um, no city wants to be seen as shrinking. That, that's a bad word. That's a, that, that's a uh, how many words, <laughs> how many letters? Uh, and, uh, and it's something that no city wants to say about itself. But uh, Youngstown was saying, was thinking that by uh, acknowledging the facts of their population decline, they could find opportunity. They could find new ways of creating uh, urban living. Uh, but uh, and so so Terry went out and looked at a couple of the places, and specifically she looked at the Sharon Line neighborhood, uh, which has around four thousand residents, uh, and. Uh, it was one of the, the, the newest neighborhoods when the population began to shrink, so it was uh, easier maybe to do it. Uh, but it, it, what has happened there is that it now has allowed for new possibilities of uses. And, and one, so this is the Sharon line here and some of the, so the streets that have been, that have been de decommissioned, maybe not as many as need to be decommissioned, but it's a start. Uh, and then uh, we wanted to highlight one story. It's, um, uh, uh, from, from Terry's piece. The remaining residents have space to spread out and experiment with alternative land uses. One notable example is Lorenzo Killer Brooks, uh, a Sharon Line resident, national drag race champion. In July 2018, uh, the Valley Summer Fest and Race Car Show honored Mr. Brooks as the first black national drag racing champion with a highway sign heralding his achievements. He decided to install a test and tune track in Sharon Line, repurposing a, a decommissioned street directly behind the, re, the recognition sign. He installed 75 feet of concrete on guardrails. So we begin to see uh, local residents 
uh, creating new kind of spatial relationships and one can say radical programmatic uh, relationships uh, as the, uh, through the recognition of uh, the, the cities shrinking. And next is the rivers continue on and the Mahoning is no exception by Charles Frederick. In uh, this beautiful piece, uh, Charles, uh, describes the, the, the Charles, uh, the, the Charles, sorry, and I'm, I'm in Boston suddenly, uh, the, the Mahoning River as it moves down the Mahoning Valley and the experience uh, at multiple moments and specifically begins to, to point out uh, the series of dams and uh, an industrial infrastructure that has been created to take uh, advantage of the river itself uh, as natural resource and, and, and that even though we have done all these things, we have uh, brought the rivers into the steel mills to cool the furnaces and brought it back down at, at scalding temperatures back into the river, even though we have dumped all these toxins, the river continues on. It's a quite beautiful metaphor about uh, the movement of river, potentially the, the, the movement in, in a region. Uh, finally, uh, the, I uh, actually a few of us went out, but I ended up writing the piece uh, uh, about the Mahoning River and one of the, the so the Eastgate go, uh, government um, uh, organization realized that this damming project uh, problem that Charles has identified was was creating you know was not allowing the river to to uh, get rid of its toxins. It was not uh, be al allowing the river to be clean. And it also meant that many of the communities were, were turning their back against the river. Uh, so the Eastgate uh, group uh, uh, developed a, a project to begin to demolish the nine dams that served industry throughout the, the Mahoning Valley. Uh, we visited the first one uh, in Lowellville, Ohio. Uh, and for this, we'll show you the picture of what, uh, how the river was used. As, as you can see, it was used as, a, as an industrial uh, good more than anything at a certain moment. Uh, and again, cooling the, these furnaces and, and moving the water through it, sediment on it, um, toxins found as early as the 30s in, in, the, in the water. And uh, you can only imagine, and the dams also uh, not allowing the, the flows to continue, but as part of the demolishing project, they're also uh, removing and treating the sediment itself. So it's not like they're just letting the, the, the water move on to the Ohio River where it, the, the Mahoning River ends and then the Mississippi River. Uh, so in Louisville, we began by uh, having a, a conversation about this drawing that an eight-year-old uh, painted in the 1980s uh, about seeing the Mahoney River as an asset, and again, in a moment when basically all the infrastructure and the communities looked away from it. Uh, and we began to, and, and this sparked a certain amount of imagination, this community of Louisville, to think about uh, creating plans to remove it. This is Mayor Yunachi, who is uh, the leader there and who has been planning the removal of the dam and then the reuse of the area around it for a uh, new uh, urban development to recenter almost the, 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 the city towards the water. Uh, also uh, linking up with the, the regional uh, recreation uh, corridors. Uh, there's a big bike path that goes from Pennsylvania uh, to through uh, Cleveland into New York state. Um, um, I might be wrong about the specific ones, but uh, the, to link up with those recreation ones and to create uh, both an economic, social, and civic asset uh, coming out of the, the cleaning of the river itself. Uh, the, the dam has actually, in fact, been taken down and they're in the beginning to develop the, the area around it. With yeah, I just that, want to say, sorry, can I just jump in, Killian, to say that Eastgate, um, they're going to be, they're on track to demolish six of their nine dams on the Mahoning River by the end of next year. So Louisville's the first, um, but by the end of next year, uh, six of, uh, five of the rest of the nine will also be, will be removed. Um, and uh, Eastgate, in addition to that, is also working uh, with a private sector consultant to think about a larger uh, river design strategy. So um, this is kind of their vision for the future of the valley is really around the river kind of reclaiming itself as the backbone of the region. 
So um, thank you so much, Kristen. And with that, uh, we want to thank you all. Uh, uh, we want to say that, you know, one thing that we wanted to note was um, how important this project has been for us at the CUDC to, as we mentioned, we all have worked in Mahoney Valley in multiple places and ways. But really this deep dive through the American Roundtable has been really helpful, really helpful to to put some of the, con the issues that we're looking at in Cleveland and in other communities in Northeast Ohio in context uh, that there, there's more commonality there than not. As well as uh, to, to we, we are working on a project on a federal grant with the Youngstown State University a group, uh, Workforce Development, imagining the, the future work through urban design in the area. And uh, the going back and forth between the more professional kind of work of thinking about these issues and this kind of reporting of the issues on the ground has been incredibly helpful to go back and forth. So one of the things we want to reflect on the process of creating this report. Uh, so without further ado, now we'll give you Helen Liggett. Okay, thank you. Um, my piece is called A City Built by Hand. The purpose of the of City Built by Hand is to document how committed volunteers working with the support of institutions such as community groups, churches, nonprofits, government entities, and private public partnerships create community using vacant land and public spaces. The photo essay is a sequence constructed of images of on site activities and excerpts from informal conversations with community members. Beginning with guidance from the executive directors and staff members of Trumbull Neighborhood Partnership and Youngstown Development Corporation, I contacted neighborhood activists and set up appointments to visit. In the course of the initial round, I employed a modified reputational method to learn about similar projects and linkages to broader activities and groups. This led to further contacts and visits. Research and walking around led to the discovery of additional sites. The resulting essay documents a series of connections among addressing the vacant land issue, the creative imagination and dedication of community members, making public spaces work and building a stronger community or cultural infrastructure. One of the mysteries of conventional narratives about underreported cities and towns is why these places are assumed to be empty or dormant. The advantage of documentary work is it can be a powerful educator about just how active life on the ground actually is. Of Warren and Youngstown, one might say they persist, but this is not a dogged persistence. One is struck by the purpose, direction, fulfillment, and joy that accompany making public space. Success here is not connected to scale. It can come from tending to a single vacant lot. It is embedded in seeing alternative possibilities, figuring out how to rise to the pandemic occasion, creating something new, making connections that bring folks out and create the reality of joint enterprises. In addition, success here is not wedded to duration or plans to expand. It has to do with a number of here and nows. City Built by Hand aims to illuminate the successes operating in the here and now of summer 2020. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen, for, for describing your process and the project. And now I would like to invite Matt and Gary. Um, you can see this is the, the amazing staff and, and folks that work at Trumbull Neighborhood Partnership. And Matt and, and Gary are going to introduce us to some ideas around the identity of the sites and the future. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Killian, and thank you, Kristen, Helen, Gary, and everyone. Um, I'm Matt. I'm the director of Trumbull Neighborhood Partnership. Uh, briefly, we're a community development corporation. We're about a decade old. Uh, we were launched in 2010. Uh, fairly conventional CDC with the quality of life mission. Um, we do a lot of things around housing and food access, community organizing, public art, other things. For, for today's conversation about building a better Warren, we're gonna just move right over into the housing conversation and particularly blight remediation and job creation. So when we started, we had a tally 
1,500 vacant houses in the city of Warren. Um, there's only about 20,000 structures in the city, residential structures in the city, population 39,000. So we found that to be fairly significant. Um, we immediately got to work at trying to raise funding to address these properties and sort of perform a triage, um, which houses need to be demolished, unfortunately, which can be salvaged and become home ownership opportunities. Um, we did take on the management of the Trumbull County Land Bank, which is a sort of a significant um, mechanical uh, piece of our work. That's how we deliver on our housing uh, outcomes. So um, as we got into the work of raising funding to do rehab, uh, demolition, maintenance, greening, all of these things, um, what we found very quickly is that we had a shortage, and Killian mentioned this, of local contractors. As a matter of fact, when we put work out to bid, we were not even getting enough um, responses to, ha to you know, have competitive bidding process uh, in many cases. And we still, to this day, have a shortage of uh, contractors that are here local, able to do this work, whether we're talking about mowing lawns to demolition companies. There's a sort of a shortage across the board. Um, so once the funding that we raised reached a certain level, we realized we have a responsibility to create jobs here at TMP doing this work. Um, and it's important to note, Killian mentioned, we don't require that you come in with a background in any of this kind of work, particularly the where we are now, our crew can teach the, any new members what, um, you know, this, the sort of tricks of the trade. And our idea here is to not only create these jobs to execute these resident plans that we uh, re released in 2015, but also to potentially incubate businesses, future businesses. Um, our team is six people full-time year round. And I have to mention th that those jobs have health benefits, the same benefits package that any program staff here has that's extremely important to us. We do go up to eight in the, in the summer because of the increased lawn mowing. Um, and yet if everybody left, hopefully not at all at once, but if everybody left to go start a company, I think that's a success. That said, um, Gary, everybody, we love our crew and um, we do hope that they stick around. So um, just to give a quick tally of what they've done since the program was launched in 2016, we've done a thousand intake assessments, just inspecting the property coming in. So that includes boarding up properties in many cases. Um, we've done 500 deconstructions. That's hugely important to us for a number of reasons um, in advance of the, you know, the, de the necessary demolition. 100 greening installations, um, 75 renovations, and we are approaching 10,000 individual mows, uh, grass cuttings. Uh, that's, uh, that's another big part of our work. Uh, that's a very brief summary of what, of what the crew does and what the sort of the vision was. I will mention that we did look at the worker-owned model at the outset. Um, we decided to hold back on that and keep the, the, the liability and the risk here with the nonprofit, and it'll remain that way for a while. But uh, as we go forward, we're extremely interested in seeing this model scaled and or replicated because that's the key here. You know, we can't replace the 3,000 jobs um, that were lost recently, but we we could quadruple, you know, tomorrow and and, and have plenty to do. Um, and this can also be replicated in a completely different arena. So uh, th th that's all I'll say for now to keep it short. Um, and Gary's going to talk a little bit. Gary's the, the one out doing the work every day. Um, so I'll pass over to you, Gary. Uh, hi, I'm Gary. No. So basically kind of to pick up where Matt was saying, like, uh, before I had this job, I actually worked in like, uh, a lot of my jobs were retail behind the counter. Like I started at all rallies just to show you like a complete different field. So when I came here, I didn't have any of the skills of like, uh, you know, basic power tools, uh, boarding up houses and things like that. And really, uh, getting teamwork in and seeing how like I could impact my community. So like, you know, between the cutting grass and the greening installations and actually getting out in the community and picking up trash and talking with people and seeing like, you know, kind of the ideas they have and, uh, just, you know, the changes around here. Uh, this job's allowed me to uh, actually see like the individual efforts that it does take to, uh, you know, kind of see some changes come forth and just, uh, you know, um, mainly like Matt was saying, uh, being in the community and working here is a great benefit because I see a lot of the stuff that happens, some of the houses that come down or the fences that go up or if someone gets a new home or just renovations and just kind of seeing like one try to, you know, pick itself back up. So, I mean, it's definitely a, 
it's been a great uh, experience over the last three years for me. Killian, do you want to um, conclude at all, or um, is it back oh, to you? To say thank you to everyone and to you. Very good. Thank you, everyone. Um, and at this time, actually, Killian, if you might stop um, the screen share, um, we can all join together for um, some discussion. And please, um, those of you in the audience, please add any questions to the Q&A feature, and we will try and get to those. Um, just to, I guess, to start the conversation, I'd, I'd love to hear all of your thoughts a little bit more on, on the manufacturing as the sort of DNA of the Mahoning Valley that um, people still identify as a manufacturing region, the contentiousness of the statue that you were mentioning, um, Killian. How is the community working through that, I guess? You know, it, where even if there is a new manufacturing boom, it's not going to look like 1960. Um, and I'm curious to know whether people feel that it's a certain established is in, in a way holding the region back or um, if, if there's a sort of trauma of, from those closures that people are still working through and how the community is attempting to have those conversa conversations um, to imagine a, a different future and, and then what some of those visions might be, what other um, assets or um, capacities is, is the Valley thinking about and trying to push into beyond um, you know, this, the steel manufacturing that it's so well known for. I mean, we have some observations from our time working at the CDC, but I kind of, when thinking about deferring to Matt and Gary on this as residents of the Valley. I mean, it's, it's very common. I hear, um, we've been here 10 years and I hear very frequently, you know, we just got to fire these factories back up and we'll be back to where we were. And, um, you know, the, uh, particularly depending on the generation that we're speaking with, uh, but yeah, that is a significant, uh, I'd say, challenge that perhaps there's a, a, a sort of um, a, a version to sort of moving forward and looking at a way that has a more diversified economy. Um, but sort of contrasting that, we do a lot of youth organizing, um, you know, and even folks my son's age, he's 20, uh, actually Gary's not much older than him, we hear from a lot of people who don't really have that sort of a connection to the, the previous identity of what work was in the Mahoning Valley. And, and even though I think our history is extremely important, let me, let me say that. And I think that there is future in manufacturing here. I think that's, that's very clear. But I think what we've also learned is that the economy needs to be diversified. And so there's a, a bit of a freedom in the sense that um, younger folks aren't as attached to the notion that that is the singular way to move forward. I'll just say that um, maybe an, an analog to that is this question that Killian raised of this, this idea of Youngstown as a shrinking city and whether or not they would kind of embrace that idea as part of their identity. And um, I, it was sort of a brief period about 10 years ago when the, um, the, the mayor of Youngstown said, you know what, we are shrinking. We're down to you know, 65 plus thousand people after 170,000. And what, what might happen if we actually acknowledge that? What new opportunities would there be? And um, I think what Terry's piece shows is that, um, you know, this question of kind of what was in the past is obviously very, you know, it's still important as to Matt's point and it's something that's still very sacred. Um, it can, you know, um, it can provide kind of one foundation for the city moving forward, um, but it also is, it's difficult, right? It's not a monolith. Um, and I think this question of like, is this a shrinking city or is it not, um, got a lot of pushback as well from a lot of the people who have been here a really long time and thought we could grow again. We have the space to grow into again. Um, we have opportunities. We have you know lots of really wonderful assets. So I think it's complicated. Um, I, I would say the kind of the question of the manufacturing identity, um, I've been doing a little bit less work with that than you know someone on the ground like Matt has until very recently. But this question of like, is this a shrinking place? Is this a growing place? I think that is still very essential in this question of identity, and it guides the politics. You know, it guides these decisions that get made around around this question of what the future is. And again, I think to Matt's point, it's not one future; it's many. 
Um, and if I may add to it, because I think the political aspect is really interesting about this, the Mahoning Valley and, and the, uh, the no, Ma Mahoning Valley, which is both uh, Trumbull and Mahoning County, are basically swing states in the election in a swing, so swing, swing districts in a swing state. So you constantly hear about this. So one of the things that gets complicated in this region around questions of work is that that is becomes politicized. So some of the huge things that you end up seeing that may or may not actually help folks on the ground in the urban centers specifically and especially, um, it may be more to, to appeal to po national politics. So there's actually an interesting thing that happens here. And, and I think the question of scale, obviously I'm sure that this is a conversation we've had throughout the American Roundtable conversations is that there might be two economies, one at the level of GMLG and there might be one at the level of the building a better world. Uh, and, and, and what happens when those two, how do, how, what is the relationship? What, how do we create the ecosystem or not? Or how do we double down on the fact that a lot of, uh, a lot of folks, I mean, uh, we're, we're, all you hear was sometimes when you t hear about this new workforce development, not only in this region, but internationally. So the same thing in Brazil, it's about automation. So at the same time that these big things are coming, it's unclear if they're gonna bring jobs, you know, they, or they're gonna be much fewer and they're gonna be for a few much more elite uh, kind of folks. So what's left for the, the rest of us that need to, we need to buy milk and, and be proud of our community. I have a couple of questions that, you know, the, the issues are so big and so um, emblematic, I think, of, of questions that face the entire country. But I want to ask a couple of things that go to the issue of scale, both spatial scale and the relationship of the local and the national, as you were all just talking about, but also time scale and the relationship of the past to the present to the future and whether it's you know how we can somehow move towards thinking about longer term investment so there's a long preamble and but I also want to say that I realize these questions are so big that there's you know certainly no expectation that the answers are going to be um, that it's possible to answer them totally specifically but to the to the issue that you brought up Killian, of the local and the national and the two types of economies. I mean, what would all of you envision as the desirable um, kind of balance between those um, two, between local initiative and local responsibility and more national investment? And, and is there any reason to think about um, any national or larger scale regional input into into planning what you know how to use the assets of the Mahoning Valley and also just to complexify a little bit more you know we're in so we're in Earth Week and yesterday was Earth Day and President Biden announced this very ambitious um, set new set of environmental goals for the country something that that nags at me all the time is we have um you have such um extensive physical assets there just thinking for a moment not not so much about um people but about the physical assets of the place the infrastructure the um civic buildings even the um the industrial buildings and you know all of this um surplus of residential stock and we have nationally a huge shortage of housing so is there any way of bringing the local and the um and the national together to use those assets in a way that goes you know beyond what is needed immediately in the Mahoning Valley so there's a big set of questions for you that I'd love to hear what all of you um are thinking about on these issues Um, I'll just say from on my kind of professional side, uh, some of the meetings that we've been in lately have, uh, there's been a really refreshing turn in the discussion strictly away from, or away from just strictly number of jobs, number of jobs, number of jobs, and into this question of quality of life. Um, and I think that's maybe speaking a little bit to Rosalie, your kind of conversation about 
you know, the actual kind of physical fabric and the character and the kind of, I mean, these are very, these are very livable cities, you know, they're not too big, they're easy to get around, um, but you still, you know, they're still kind of big enough that you um, have some options ahead of you. Um, so if we can really kind of think about these places as areas where this kind of livability and this quality of life and the connection to the larger environment, the connection to recreation, um, you know, they're sort of within the larger metro region of both Pittsburgh and Cleveland, but they're their own kind of metro center as well. So I think we've been hearing some really positive movement towards thinking about economic development, not just in terms of raw jobs numbers, but in terms of how do we kind of look at the cities holistically? How do we look at the landscape holistically? How do we think about a keep, a keeping people here, about kind of like attracting a new workforce? Like what would make someone wanna to move to Warren and Youngstown? What would make someone wanna stay in Warren and Youngstown? And I think as much as we can keep turning the discussion of economic development into those larger questions, I think that's, that's maybe one really positive way um, forward for the, for the region. Matt or Gary, do you guys? Yeah, I think I'll just add, I mean, there's a, a number of assets here that, um, you know, I don't want to leave anything out, but the, just sort of the way you asked the question really just made me think immediately the river, you know, the river, which was so integral to the previous uh, manufacturing and was then thusly uh, contaminated and even to the point of no contact uh, orders at, in several spots for many, many years, we're starting to clean the river up. You're starting to see these dams be removed. So in terms of quality of life here for our residents, looking at the rivers as being you know, the, the asset here, we have a series of parks here in Warren that run from the Northwest side into downtown. Um, it's just a, such a wonderful opportunity to really showcase something that, you know, when we first started 10 years ago, wasn't really utilized, um, known, talked about, featured. So I know both communities and all spots in between are really looking to really look at that river as a huge asset to build from for recreation and otherwise. Yeah, and I we didn't kind of get too much into it, but yeah, obviously with the legacy of industry, there's a ton of brownfields along the river as well, which creates a lot of challenge um, in terms of redevelopment, but also opportunity because we've got these huge tracts of land that used to be those 27 steel mills. And if we can, you know, keep pecking away at trying to kind of get some industrial cleanup, keep thinking about chaining those things together into a larger strategy. There's a lot of people on the ground doing that kind of thought work right now, um, especially at Eastgate Council of Governments. So um, I do think to Matt's point, I think the river is a, a, one of the potential kind of ways that the whole region can start to reorient itself back, back to itself, so. And as part of the skill question, the up and down, I think that, that you know, it's an interesting question. So there is some regional planning, uh, both the, the, even the, the recreational kind of project that we were talking about, the river itself, so regional planning effort, uh, as well as the voltage valley, which is the, the way they're trying to brand this kind of effort. Uh, that includes the Mahoney Valley, but even might go beyond it to, to be a center of um, electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, advanced manufacturing, new ways of manufacturing and all that. Uh, so there's some of that, but I, what I find often is that those sets of planning sometimes don't get down on the ground enough and, and ignore or, uh, or don't explore enough the things that folks on the ground are already doing and this everyday practices. So. For example, one of the things I, I taught a studio looking at Warren lessons, and I remember going to Matt. So uh, what are the conversations here around the gig economy? He's like, do you mean like the, the uh, I know a guy kind of culture? And, 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 and he's like, yeah, everyone knows a guy and, every, and all those guys are doing different things. So it became an actually really interesting thing in the studio where we all try to identify those, those uh, I know a guy moments, uh, including even the Amish who like built tons of things in Warren. Uh, and, and that as a kind of, not, not, not quite informal, but uh, other model of economy that exists that is successful at teaching skills, that is successful, I mean, obviously it has its insularity and issues, but, but, but what are the things that already are happening here that we can, that it can be ignored, that we can learn from, and then link them to the larger networks? I think that that's where I'm, I'm really kind of interested in part of what we're doing and part of what we're doing even now is thinking about how workforce development and these kind of ins into larger networks can become places to think about vacancy differently, public space differently, and even to use some of the housing and then hopefully been working with TMP and other folks on the ground to create some systems for that to happen. 
One um, sort of follow-up question from all of that, I'd love to hear just kind of what's actually happening on the ground. Um, with all of the sort of massive industrial sites, many of which are now still sort of vacant or underused, um, you spoke a little bit about the remediation, but what, what are the visions just actually for those? I mean, because they were such a dominant presence and they, as you, Kristen, in the interest said, take up so much um, of the valley, you know, what is what is actually happening right now? With it those? depends on the site. And, and we've been working on a couple of them specifically. One is owned by a, a Ukrainian oligarch and is literally being left to rot. <laughs> Uh, and, and it has, and this is kind of a little bit of a scandal, it was uh, it published, uh, I think, the very day, many of the photos that you saw in the introduction were taken on the day that that article appeared in the newspaper of, and, and how the, they bought it, they're holding on it, and, and they're not doing anything with it. But what not holding, any, not doing anything with it literally means that there's runoff that is going into uh, environmental sites right on the river. So doing nothing is actually a negative, it's bad. <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I can share with you that there's plans. Uh, I, there are many folks that with electric uh, uh, solar power and things like that. There's the, the, the reality is both that there are plans and that there aren't. And this is something that we keep actually finding and uh, finding that there are many plans. And then, but when you dig into it, it's unclear whether those plans actually exist. And it, and this goes back a little bit to the idea that although there's attention and political attention, even political money uh, paid to, to this area, when it hits the ground, often what you find is that some of these promises don't always make it down and some of the plans kind of break through. So there's sites that, there's one site in Southern uh, Warren, the, the BDM site that has been cleaned and, and is no longer, but then uh, the, the previous owner just turned it over and, and it's unclear what's happening to it now, but there does seem to, uh, there does seem to be a plan. So, so that's the answer, that they're big, they're out there, but there's not always, the, the ownership is weird, ownership uh, because these companies, and I tracked this a little bit in the introduction, how uh, like what used to be uh, one, you know, let's say Ohio Steel or something like that has become five different companies throughout time. One of those companies might still be working. And actually, I think that's the case in the, in the, in the Copperwell side. One of those companies still working. Two of the others, uh, one is was sold to Ukrainian. The other one uh, is, is a, basically a, a vacant site with, with the TMP and the land bank beginning to think about what to do with it. But you can imagine with a, for a small organization like TMP dealing with a super fun site or and maybe let's call it Brownsville, maybe super fun is too much. Uh, a Brownsville site is, can be a lot. And yeah, and definitely raises the issue of what new ways we might think about um, incorporating long-term um, corporate responsibility into dealing with sites, you know, that, they, that it's not possible, makes it not possible to just use up um, and walk away from in some way. Yeah, I'll just I, I say on the, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say on the, on the brownfield side, you probably already know this, but you know, remediation is, you sort of remediate to the end use. And if the end use is not known yet, everything kind of like waits for each, it's like a kind of like vicious cycle that happens. And especially in a place where the market is weak, um, what's the kind of incentive to invest millions into remediating a site that may or may not have a kind of dedicated end use yet. So, you know, there's, there's federal funding, you know, there's EPA funding, a lot of that's predicated on end use, a lot of that's predicated on having kind of a, a, a way forward, a path forward. I know Matt and his team do a lot of the kind of really important on the ground work to untangle all of these, um, all of these complications, but everything's kind of waiting for everything else in some way on this, some of these sites. Yeah, like as an example for St. Joe's, you know, it looks like we're very close to getting that property demolished, which is long overdue. Um, you know, the funding could come from EPA, which um, doesn't allow for any uh, use besides greening, which is, you know, perfectly fine with me. Um, but that's very limiting, you know, especially over the long term. It's also possible that the funding we get is from somewhere else and actually requires housing, which we don't currently need. So yes, untangle is a really good word. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's very complicated. Um, to maybe take two questions from the um, from the audience um, that people have um, sent in. 
these two are a bit related, but um, could you all speak a little bit more about how um, the community is receiving um, the type of work that you're doing and um, how I think the, the sort of ways of thinking that you've all been talking about and, and um, not being the sort of political football that it, it, it has been in a certain way um, is being received, but also then who is communicating that? And, and you know, someone has asked um, who's responsible for leading communication and amplifying civic pride um, along with the assets and skilled um, workforce of the Mahoning Valley to attract new business and entrepreneurs. So I, I'd love to hear kind of both sides of that. You know, how, how are people be, um, being receptive? And then also are people stepping into um, those shoes to try and be um, cheerleaders and to sort of um, remake um, those uh, sort of visions and assets? Uh, well, one thing that I will say is that, uh, like, oftentimes when we're out on these, uh, say, like, vacant properties or lots or, say, somewhere where a house has been torn down, a lot of times neighbors feel free to come out and either suggest, like, if they're interested themselves in buying the property or if, like, they'd like to see it, it potentially turn into something else or even just, like, you know, hey, is there anything, like, if could we buy the house as is potentially? Because, like, most people that live here, they, they want to continue living here and would like to see it restored back to its original, you know, what it looked like. Uh, even people sometimes volunteer to help us out. Like, you know, people are just looking any way to get the trash picked up, any way to like, just make it look like people are having effort at least around here, you know? And uh, I definitely think with uh, like some of these buildings coming down and that, you know, giving us the, the land here, as long as people can see that there's room to rebuild, maybe we'll get people to start investing or so. I can share with you about, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure. And Alex actually happens to be an ex student of the Kent State University, was at the CUDC. And so as part of the, and was working the Bahoni River project. So someone that knows quite well all this work and a, a very active participant in these conversations, including the community engagement ones. I'll share with you a little bit about the specific um, uh, report. Uh, is that, is that uh, a few of the pieces like the Building a Better War and the employee ownership, the Jennifer Roller piece is really making the rounds in the Valley. Uh, that's, that's one that I have seen lot, lots of social media around as well as, as, well as the river. Uh, there's an interest, I think, I mean, uh, like often we see today, almost every plan goes into it with uh, questions around equity. Most folks don't know how to actually make that happen. <laughs> Uh, and that it's always becomes the, the interesting thing of our role, even as designers sometimes uh, within uh, these larger plans and, and even ourselves who have uh, dealt, uh, put ourselves within uh, larger economic planning as well, uh, is that how to translate those um, uh, desires into actual plans and actually noticing these things are happening, these communities and, and, and going in, and I feel like the Jennifer Roller piece might be giving a vision for something like that. And Matt, I think, whatever. Anybody else on on that one? Helen, you um, you've been quiet, but your um, your photo essay is so um, so evocative of the and so attentive to the um, specific efforts of individuals and, and community groups. Um, anything you want to add in on that one? You're on mute. You're on mute. It's too bad because what I just said was remarkable. So I'll just try <laughs> to reconstruct here. Um, no, I, I guess what, what I would say, when, when you sent out a, a, a early questions, um, there, were, there was a question about um, how much is organic um, versus driven by the city or nonprofit work. Um, and I took or, organic to mean um, things that um, citizens initiated on their own. And when I... Um, thought about that question, I thought that um, it was actually could be framed better, um, that that's not the real question. Um, the real question is that it should be thought of as a web, a web of uh, support and a web of um, people who are um, dedicated and serving. And that in order for anything to work, there has to be a person or a group of people who devote themselves to that individual project. 
they have to decide, um, community members have to decide th they want it. Um, so, so it's, and in addition that the projects, it ebbs and flows, um, different kinds of support, different people interested. Um, so it's, it's much more volatile. Um, that, so that, so that's a way of sidestepping the question. Um, the other thing that, that I wanted to say was that um, one of the things that surprised me when I was doing this was the extent to which there was um, interaction and combinations of sort of new um, activities and the legacy. Um, there's some very beautiful public spaces in Warren and Youngstown. And there's, they, they are in some of these things that are happening now, they're, um, they use each, use each other isn't the quite, but the facilities are, are being used by both sort of types of groups. Um, and that was the, the fact of the legacy spaces and the way that they're also being used um, by smaller groups was a surprise to me. And I thought that that was um, actually quite wonderful. Um, so a call for any last comments before we, um, before we close for the day? Anybody? Okay, then I will just say um, thank you all so, so much for some for a report that is so um, that raises so many important issues. I mean, first of all, that is so that gives one a feel for the Mahoning Valley and for you know a place that is extremely interesting um, in and of itself. But it also raises so many issues for the entire country, I think, and and you know probably for the entire world, figuring out how we move forward um, with a more balanced approach to places that have been um, the seats of industry. And as we move into whatever future we can figure out that is more um, sustainable and supportive for everyone. So um, thank you. Um, and thank you to everybody who's here um, in the audience, including a number of um, or several authors of earlier um, American Roundtable reports. And I know a number of people who have been um, involved in, in this report and in work in the Mahoning Valley. I hope you'll all take a look next Tuesday um, when the, the final report in this round of American Roundtable projects, um, which is on Africatown, Alabama, is gonna be published on our site. And then two weeks from today, um, when we'll have a program related to that project. So again, thank you all and um, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Pleasure. <laughs>